That's what I'm going to do, is look at the skeptics today and to see what they have to say about the Shroud. I'm not a true believer in the Shroud, even though it seems like I am from my comments and my conclusions, but what I am is I think that the Shroud is a genuine artifact that has significant historical value, and it certainly has uh, more age to it than simply shown by this carbon-14 dates in the 19... Uh, 88. So that would be my conclusion is that uh, it's, it has a historical record that's maybe a lot longer than we think and it could be related to the uh, actual burial shroud of Christ. I'm not going to try to prove that today. I'm trying to analyze is it a real historical artifact not created by a human artist would be my main, my main historical conclusions on this. So the thing I want to relate to today my first conclusion is just to review what we're trying to talk about today. That is the fact that we have a, uh, a burial shroud that we've seen here. We're going to examine the optics nature of the shroud, the fact that there's blood in the shroud, which has been contested but now been pretty well identified. Uh, we're going to identify pollen on the shroud that can be traced to Jerusalem and the Constantinople in Turkey, which is not found in Europe. We'll identify the fabric, specific fabric, and which is a new result that can be identified to first century practice, sewing practices and cloth practices and not found in, in Europe, particularly the fact that the, you'll find out that the, shroud, the fabric has uh, patterns in it of bleaching that are not formed in Europe. In Europe, the bleaching will be done as a whole fabric cloth. So uh, also founding limestone dirt on the the shroud as well, which is traceable to Jerusalem area. And we'll talk about Roman crucifixion and the nature of it. And in fact, it's the crucifixion is so carefully and accurately pointed out that in 1986, the Journal of the American Medical Association actually published an article that used the information in the shroud uh, for validating how a crucifixion was performed. Uh, and it, of course, there was a lot of conflict over that. Uh, people didn't like to see that. And we'll also talk about burial practices. Europe, uh, Jewish burial practices were a lot different than people have imagined in art. We'll see the burial practices involve the fact they were put on a ledge and left to decay and then reburied in an ossuary or bone box. Then we'll show about the Shout history, many from uh, 1355 to the present, and uh, it's what we can show as historical. And we'll show about the Mendelian. I won't talk too much about that today, but you can see that in my other video, for example. And we'll talk about the, mainly I want to identify the, the 14, uh, carbon 14 dating and the, the history of that in 1988 and the results from that and why that's statistically an invalid uh, sample in the first place. And second of all, it contradicts almost everything we know else about the shroud dating and otherwise. More vanillin test on how the uh, linen uh, is, uh, changes its vanillin count over a period of years. And we'll talk about the new result I found out from the uh, Prey Codex, which identifies m many specific features of the shroud uh, to two centuries before its alleged creation by the skeptics. And uh, then we'll talk about image formation mechanisms just barely, mainly because we can only speculate, well, we can only show what it's not, that it's not something. We show it's, n it's uh, not a work of art is what we can identify fairly clear clearly. Um, and in some ration, we'll talk about putting all this, those together. So let's move on to the first slide here. That is a, sort of a picture of the Stout. In, in 1898, the photograph you see in the top was the first picture that came out of Secundo Pia's uh, camera. And when he developed it, and all the pictures that are seen at the bottom, which is the people have seen, you can see hardly see anything from uh, hundreds of years that but that's the only thing they had to work with. But Secundo Pio, when you had the negative image, all of a sudden he realized that the shout, its image itself is like a negative image because the negative we made by photography, photography was a fact, a positive image from what we expected. And 1976, they found out that that image has actually 3D properties, three-dimensional properties and a 3D image analyzer, the shade and the darkness of that image varies inversely proportional to the distance from the slot. That is, the longer the distance uh, from the, the trod surface, the, the, the lower the image uh, density. And by the way, the image density 
is only correlated to the number of fabrics. Does anybody know old time newspaper print? Um, that new old time newspaper print, just the number of dots per inch was all that you got out of it. You didn't have a grayscale. It's called um, uh, making it, the more dots closer together would make a darker image. And so every one of those fibers has exactly the same amount of darkness on it, which a, a artist would be impossible to reproduce. But this, uh, this printing mechanism was act, the way it's performed to make darkness. Closer fibers are more fiber, dark fibers together, but they're all exactly the same darkness. The shroud image from reverse, when uh, they put a light underneath it, the shroud image totally disappears. All the chemical um, photo photographic analysis shows that it has no spectral uh, direction. An artist, no, no directional information, which it can uncode directional information. Every painting ever performed, they can find the direction the artist painted in. The shroud has no image uh, so source. The, the thing that you can't see in that picture, or even without, without image analyzing, is the fact that there apparently are uh, images of flowers and coins. On coins on the eyes. I won't talk too much about that today because that's disputed and it takes a real careful analysis to show that. I do discuss that in my other lecture I gave. But in this particular case, you can see very clearly that the man, in fact, has a, uh, has a wound on the left hand. If you take the, assume the image on the top is the positive image, the reverse image, uh, in fact, where the nail would be driven. In fact, the whole thing that's so amazing is that image shows that it came out the wrist rather than the palm. And all the 14th century art in there before has always shown the nail hole has gone through the palm of the uh, palm of this, the, 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 you know, the man on the shroud. But in this case, also, it shows that him being naked, which is totally against all art history. In fact, the art historians have said no art history has ever been made with any of these properties. Uh, that's uh, of that period or before. So the other thing that you notice about the fact is that the uh, shroud has a uh, blood stains uh, all the way through the body, and you'll find on the back, especially I didn't show the back in that particular image of little round welts. We'll discuss those little welts that appear to be dumbbells from a Roman flagrum. Uh, these uh, also you can see that the uh, that the image has got a long hair and a beard that's connected to it and blood stains like a little epsilon feature on the forehead, which we'll discuss, show a little close up of that. The main thing you can see in there, these little triangle squares are all from a, uh, a burn from 1932, 1532, when the fire of the, was so hot it created melting, melting silver, burnt those holes in the fabric. You'll also see a little late, you can see the little holes in there. You can see, actually see it here to some extent, the little hole, the little, burn holes uh, in that fabric. Well, I'll come back in a close-up of that, but let's move on to the next slide. And you'll see that the, the different parts of this image of the slide has all the different features that I'm going to talk about today. I won't talk about them all, uh, but you can see that there's enormous amounts of information on the, the, uh, this shroud. An artist to create this would have had a knowledge far beyond any, any anatomist of the fifth of the 20th century, it'd be only close, but certainly the uh, 15th century would have no idea of the anatomy of a, a dead person, let alone a crucified one, to create all the different features that are seen on this shroud. Uh, and we'll discuss those in more detail without going into particular, this particular slide. So let's uh, talk about the one that I want to mainly I talk about today, and that's the carbon-14 dating, since this is all new. The uh, carbon-14 dating was announced in 1988 that uh, the shroud was definitely a uh, forgery because it was definitely, according to their opinion, the three men here is serving as judge and uh, jury and executioner of the shroud, uh, that uh, Edward Hall, uh, Michael Tate, and Robert Hedges, and, and 13 October, they have, they notice they have a 1260 to 1390 exclamation point on the blackboard. So meaning that we're certain, absolutely certain of this date with 95% confidence. And if you read the fine print, it says anyone that disbelieves our result is like, uh, might as well be a flat earther, you know. <laughs> so they're, they're, it's sort of an argument by intimidation more than anything else. Oops. But uh, so what, what was his quote here? Robert Hall 
is making a, uh, Edward Hall is, is saying that uh, there was a multi-million uh, business, dollar business, pound business in making forgeries during the 14th century. Someone just got a bit of linen, faked it, and flogged it. In fact, uh, you'll see when I talk about the, the dumbbells on the back of the shroud, some guy, act, critic, actually implied that somebody actually flogged the cloth that made these marks. And like I say, no, you can't do that. And yet, you know, of course, if, you're, if, you, if you want to believe that, you can do, <laughs> believe that, but it, it isn't going to happen by flogging the cloth itself. This isn't going to happen. The detail is just too fine, and the marks around the shroud actually have halo marks of serum on the shroud. It's just impossible for an uh, artist to reproduce. Yet uh, the interesting thing about it is that the way it's performed is they had four samples uh, submitted to each of the three laboratories. Originally, they proposed to make seven laboratories with a protocol from seven different parts of the cloth, but the uh, Catholic Church decided that was too many samples uh, to destroy the cloth. And um, so they decided to have only three laboratories and they would subdivide the samples into four. So the, but in order to do those samples and compare, they would have to have three other samples, from one from ancient first century, one from Middle Ages, and one from a, uh, another sample from an old sample. And so it would, it would be a reasonable, very, enough variation in 14th century versus first century and somewhere in between that it would give them a, what's called a, uh, a, a comparison. So they, they, they call it control samples to do. They couldn't make the control samples totally blind testing because the problem that they found out is that, that they couldn't find any other three in one he, um, herringbone twill, which is the form of the fabric. You'll see that a little later. They couldn't form that same type of fabric, even in the Middle Ages. So it's a rare, it's a rare type of fabric. But the first century, actually, it's more predominant, which is actually just the opposite. They, they didn't expect to find that problem, but they did. They could not find a three-in-one herringbone from the Middle Ages anywhere. And, and in fact, the only one they had, had only one example in their whole collection. They couldn't use it. So uh, it's actually an argument in, against the Middle Ages uh, form for the shroud. And we'll see there are many other examples of that, too, as well. Now. Going back to the first slide I showed you about the photographs, 1898 was the first modern testing of the shroud. And nothing else matters before that because nobody else t took it very seriously except the Catholic Church as they treated it as a relic. In fact, when it was found in 15, 1355, when it was actually came out of hiding, which we'll talk about more later, but it, it is that it was only taken track, the example is uh, a icon or, or uh, imagination of um, an artist's rendition. They, they didn't know what to do with it because they couldn't prove it was the Shroud of Christ. So those that held to that were simply asked to not speak up on it. So the, but the 1898 uh, photographs and 1931 photographs showed that definitely it was, it was beyond a capability of a human artist to create. I won't say that they, everybody accepted that, but the, the anatomists that examined it uh, we're, we're saying, no, this is not, not an easy thing for an artist to create. And then as the more and more tests have gone in 1976, 78, more and more detail, as we started to realize this, this idea of an artist's creation is ludicrous. It's not, a just, it's not just a, a, a critic, a remark. But in 1988, the carbon-14 dating uh, violated the protocol. How did they violate the protocol? The protocol was to take a sample from different parts of the cloth by, but by, by sampling the one section they did sample, which I'll show you in a picture, is sampling the, the so-called repairs near the repair street age region, they, they actually laid themselves into sampling a region that was not representative of the whole cloth, was representative of only that one specific area. And they did not, um, they did not use the right protocol for statistical testing. The statistical testing didn't take into account, you notice that they said, date from uh, 1260 to 1390. What they didn't say is that the variation in dates when all these samples had a statistical variance test was so large that they, there was only 5% chance that it, was, that it was actually consistent. That is, the samples were even taken from the same cloth. 
whereas the other three control samples were in one case 95% consistent, one other case 50% consistent, and I have the original data on that, but I'm not showing it here, but the, you can show it from the actual, on the shroud.com website, they actually have that original paper, but a, the actual statistics that were computed were actually incorrect by a statistician that analyzed it, and they actually, the, 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 uh, the failed statistic was actually as low as 1%, not even 5% reliable, that they were from the same cloth even, uh, or same representative sample. So it was not representative, and by, by statistical inference, the test should have, they should have come out and said, we can't test this cloth. We need more data because this test is basically failed. Anything below 5% reliability is like, uh, like guessing, you know, so it's a, it's a bad idea, but yet they somehow, because the data seemed all in the, the same region, that somehow that they could say what was all a, um, a, a just a different sample set. Uh, they didn't get anything more than uh, six, seven hundred years old, so they said, okay, we'll, we'll just say the variance is just a bad sample, but it, it's just, it's still, still good. Still, we have 95% confidence. Well, they didn't, what you don't understand with carbon-14 dating, which I've studied quite a bit, and through the years, and ever since I studied archaeology at Berkeley, is that the, that the samples that you pick have to be consistent with what you expect it to be. That is, you, you, you provide, mathematically, you provide all the evidence how it, how it fits together. You don't just pick carbon-14 dating all by itself, because in some cases, you have different, vastly different, uh, thousands of years difference between different carbon sampling, because you're examining something that has basically one one trillion to one ratio between carbon-14 and carbon-12. You know, this, you're having just minute differences in your carbon count. So it's very difficult to, to do this testing and, and say you actually have absolutely certainty because you have, beside the original amount of carbon-14, you also have contamination. One of the criticisms of the carbon-14 is what bioplastic coating of bacteria and other things. People have handled the shroud for many years. They have a lot of carbon from that. We have paint that's fallen down from the ceiling. Every, for, for thousands of years, potentially, at least 600 years, is that you have uh, other contamination that's affecting, that could be on the shroud as well. Uh, but the most specific one to refute the data really was basically the vanillin test. Um, but going back to specifically the carbon-14 dating, is that if the carbon-14 dating is from a different um, sample, in other words, other cloth has been wave, woven into that particular edge, it would invalidate the sample. The, the people that took the sample, the, the textile experts, were verifying the fact that nothing had been woven in. But, but textile efforts since then have shown definitively that very accurate textile reweaving was common during the 14th century. They had money, they had time to do reweaving that you, could do, you couldn't tell the difference between the, the different fabrics. So it's definitely possible the reweaving could happen at that period of time with old versus young. But nevertheless, that doesn't prove it's invalid. It just says that's the suggestion, there's many different suggestions that, uh, that could happen. If the carbon, if it had been subjected to neutron flux as well, that uh, it could reset the carbon that's in there to create more carbon-14. That, but I think that one of the most definitive refutations from a uh, dating technique was in 2002, Ray Rogers uh, performed a lin vanillin test as, vanilla, as linen gets older and older, the vanillin that's uh, found in it will degrade to the point that it becomes, after uh, a thousand years, it'll become, become not, none of it left. It's sort of like with carbon-14. You can't date million-year-old objects with carbon-14 because there's nothing left. You can't date anything that, when there is none. So it's the same idea with vanillin as that there was, and they raised sample, the sample they, sa they sampled, they actually could measure the amount of vanillin tested on that in the Rogers examination. Well, let me get the other possibilities for having that I'll talk about later. And that is, again, reviewing the textiles, pollen, flower images, limestone, dirt, and codex. Uh, it points, all points to a Jerusalem origin. So beside the dating techniques, we'll actually show evidence that, that the shroud had a significant part of its time in Jerusalem and, and Constantinople, and as well as in, uh, and, and, and in Constantinople in the Byzantine period, as well as in France, so where the shroud was rediscovered in 1355. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute here. Now, this is what, was the, the, what we call the Pilgrims-led uh, medallion, 
It's in the Cluny Museum in Paris. It's uh, definitely from the 1355 Expo. It's the only one that was actually, we actually can document happening in, in a little town of Liri in France, near, the, uh, near, the, near a little church there. So it was, but it was one of the more obscure places. Why would a, a shroud, a major relic, be shown in a little parish church area? Uh, of France. So the bishop, uh, Henry of Poitiers, uh, just, just refuted it, said it's obviously not, not the Shroud of Christ. You can, I won't say anything at this point, but he was, uh, the, the bishop of Lyons was not at all happy about this because they had their own relics. In case you know about the history of the Catholic Church, they have every, every major church has to have their own relics. Um, whatever saint or whatever pieces of the the uh, crucifixion that they think they have have, pro have parts of. So the, it wasn't taken seriously in 1355, but then the, uh, the people that were involved in that, the Geoffrey de Charny, you can see the words at the bottom, he has the coat of arms on the left, and the coat of arms of his wife, Jeanne, Jeanne, Jeanne de, de Vergy, uh, are the people that, are, uh, that showed the, the shroud at this point. What we guess is that he had come into the, into the possession of this object, which we think was the same as a Mendelian from Constantinople, we'll see. But the whole, whole point was is that this is not a rich person. This is not somebody that could spend umpteen amounts of uh, money trying to reproduce an object which no one knew it looked like in the first place. So it's very unlikely to be done. So no wonder Henry Portier's thought, bishop, the bishop thought, this is not something to be taken seriously. Obviously, it can't be a real relic because it's just a, a minor nobleman in uh, Leary. So they didn't even take it seriously that way. He, he just had them, ordered them to not show it anymore. And, and in the meantime, in the next year, 1356, uh, the uh, Joffrey manages to die, and his poor wife, widow, Jeanne de, Ver de Verger, has no, doesn't know what to do with it except to maybe have a showing of it, maybe earn some money that way, perhaps, to, uh, for her as a widow. So it was definitely a significant object, but certainly in no way is this person going to have the funds or finances or even the backing of the church to, to pay for a reproduction, let alone a reproduction that's defied all art historians since then, that no one, no art, his, his, no art in anything like, has, has done anything like it, any, anything remotely like it in the history of the church. It's, so it's in the history of uh, art. Well, let's go down to the shroud itself and some of the images that are found on it and to show you something about the nature of crucifixion that's, that shows up on the shroud. Again, some of this is covered in the article, which you can get from JAMA. I have a copy of it here, uh, 1986. The, uh, it's called the, uh, On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ. One of the things that's found on the shroud on the right side of the image is a flow of blood and fluid. It's on the positive image on the right, but in the negative, which will be the true life case, will be on the left. It's an elliptical wound, four 0.5 centimeters by 1.1 centimeters wide, about uh, a little less than two inches by half an inch. And it's, and uh, anatomists have shown it's in the intercostal space between the right fifth and sixth ribs. Well, what does this mean? Well, it means that as anatomist, as the one, uh, as a, a specialist involved in the, uh, in examining dead bodies, it's called forensic analysis, they found that this is directly the line with the heart and the right article. So if you come in from the left side, your, your heart is on, the, on your left side. If you come in from the right side through this third and fifth and third vertebrate, you'll, 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 you'll directly in line to, to penetrate the right oracle, which fills with blood after death. That is, the blood and water that's found in the Bible would actually be which what you would find if you penetrated a lance through that particular point. So it's very accurate from that point of view that uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's unreal for a, a uh, a artist to realize, realize that anatomy uh, detail. I brought a nice picture in from an artwork world of uh, the lance wound portrayed by a, one of my favorite artists, Caravaggio, and it's called the Incredulity of St. Thomas, found in a museum in Potsdam. It uh, shows that St. Thomas examining the wound on Jesus, uh, the lance wound, that illustrates very, caref very, very precisely about this. Uh, where the where the wound be, would be found. 
Now, the, like going to the, the wounds on the back and the side and the bottom, there's something like 120 dumbbell marks in addition to other more detailed uh, scourge marks from different instruments. They find uh, careful examinations found three different myth, methods of uh, torture involved in the Man of the Shroud. This particular one shows close-ups of the two types of dumbbells. They aren't sure if it's two or three or maybe both. They show two different lictors. Lictors are the ones that are doing the punishment from either side. You find the, these little dumbbell marks come from two different patterns coming down on either side of the back, legs, and I'm not going to show you any gruesome pictures today. These are just simply uh, an a examination of the mechanisms in the shroud. The one in the right is actually an instrument that was recreated from a dig at Herculaneum, which we went to last year. It's involved a uh, Roman flagrum, <clears throat> again being given the belay the light, to what an artist could have known. He wouldn't have known about this, this instrument. It wasn't rediscovered for, in the 1800s, so uh, an artist simply would have no idea how the Roman uh, flagrum or Roman punishment was being performed. These are about uh, two centimeters across, and they're all very precise. Every one of these marks is very precisely formed. It has a little halo of blood around it and a little, uh, little serum. Again, not, not all of them show blood because it's possible the body had been cleaned at that point, but it shows the way that there is blood, it does show serum as well. So this particular mark of the, again, of a historical detail that a forger would not know. One of the most interesting things involved in it was what we do know about crucified from a real, the only crucified victim we know of, and that's from a man named Johann Ben, that is, means son of, Hagalikol. And it's from the first century ossuary found in 1968 by an archaeologist named Zavras and examined by another archaeologist named Iku Hezu. But it's a right heel bone, and the heel bone in the, in the technical literature is calcineum, it's, it's a, but it's pierced by a, a four and a half inch iron nail with wood traces on both ends. Uh, it's from a, a tomb near uh, God give it Hamitar, tomb near south, northeast of Jerusalem. This particular one is, shows uh, that we have a, a, uh, a, a bone that's a, a, a nail that's been pierced by a long nail. The original archeologists thought this nail had pierced, pierced two heels, but more recent analysis has shown there, that's a false conclusion. In fact, this uh, he, the conclusion now is this nail only went through one heel bone and not two, and was probably connected to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the cross, we call it stirpes, the, 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 uh, the, the vertical pole at the bottom. And I'll show you something about that nature um, as well, how its crucifixion is formed. This is how the crucifixion is formed. Again, this is a sanitized version with nobody um, on it. It's the vertical portion, it's called the stipes. The vertical portion, the stipes you see, is the part that's left in place. The weight, weight, it might weigh on about 200 pounds, these, these, these uh, ones. The crosses were reused all the time because there's a shortage of wood in, in uh, the Jerusalem area. And so the stipes would be reused and be in place in the ground. And the, uh, and the vertical part called the patibulum, the cross beam would be carried by the one be, be crucified, carried on his back. It weighed up to 100 pounds, these uh, heavy lo logs, and it would be lifted up. They would attach the, the uh, crucified victim to with, with either ropes or nailing him to the patibulum, the cross beam, and then raise him into place, and then put a, uh, a, 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 a little sign at the top, in the case of Jesus and other ones, indicating the uh, crime that he had committed and accused of. And that would be how you put the cross together to make it one, uh, one object to do. They're also, now going on to the shroud in the art history literature is, uh, it's called the, the Hungarian Prey Codex. I don't think any of you have seen this, it's a fairly new observation that the Hungarian Prey Codex discovered, it was uh, from 11, carefully, uh, exactly dated within up to in the 1195 range, over a century before the alleged uh, creation of the shroud. And I'll have a lot of slides on this to go in detail. Just look in the detail of here first to start with. The, Jesus' hands are crossed over his groin. That's entirely against all the art of the ancient world of the, and any of the, any of the art on Jesus. There's no thumbs on this, mark, on this painting. 
You notice there's the thumbs indicating just in the trial there are no thumbs to be visible. His body is naked and the blood mark above the right eye. You'll see that in a close-up I have in another slide. Uh, the top is, uh, there are two images here, two different uh, scenes, the, the top and the bottom scene. And I just showed the top up close, I'll have another close up, closer up scene. So the one at the top is uh, the left is the, uh, the Josephus, Joseph and Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus and Mary, probably Mary. And then at the bottom will be Mary at the, uh, the three Marys of the tomb and the angel on the far left. But we'll have a close up of that. But just you can see here at least that you have a herringbone pattern on this particular cloth. Again, it's a strange thing you wouldn't see, but the most strangest one will be this L-shaped L-shaped pattern of holes, which are known, which are in the cloth, uh, whatever this cloth is from the 11th, 90s uh, period of time, which is, uh, to my mind, conclusively identifies it with the shroud. Any one of these objects. Let's go down the 11 different uh, um, symbols that are in this particular shroud. The first thing is the shroud is twice the length of any man. All the other shroud pictures. Up until this, before this picture, have shown only a shroud that covers the man or, or parts of the picture. That's why uh, the people have thought the Mendelian was only just the head of a man. That's the one, the, the, the shroud picture found in uh, Constantinople. And we'll talk about that some more. Why it's a picture of only a man that is, even though it was uh, folded up to show just the head. But I'm not going to do that much today. Uh, the herringbone weave pattern. Second, number three, the L-shaped pattern of holes front and back. Again, this is a poker hole. Somebody had poked the shroud with a, a sharp uh, flaming object, perhaps, that would cause these holes. It has beard and long hair. Some people have actually disputed, well, did they really have beards? Um, did we have long hair? Well, that's bi biblical does show that, that the, the, um, ancient, the Jews of that period do have beards and long hair. The body was naked against all arch history, uh, Observation, other examples. A mark above the right eye corresponding to the reverse three shaped uh, blood stain on the shroud. That's the epsilon shape. Uh, right hand over the left. Long, fing long fingers. Some people have criticized the shroud based on the fact that uh, the shroud has, man has fingers that are unrealistically long. Perhaps there's an example of that, but we don't uh, have a good answer for that. It's a good critique. No thumbs, though that was. Again, the argument is the fact when you're crucified through the wrist, your thumbs disappear. Uh, they've shown that you know, with Barbet did in the 1930s about with, uh, with victims that were cadavers. He, exam he checked, he did with uh, the Nate Rail Room and, so and that particular case was on the right wrist. Again, all other art history has shown that the art um, has shown the, the uh, nail through the palm. But uh, Barbet found in the 1930s that the crucified victim would be as they're being hanging from the cross, the weight would, the, the, the uh, nails would just pull out of the palms. It would not hold the weight of the body. And second of all is that the uh, body would actually have to be, they'd raise themselves up to, um, to, re, to, to breathe. And then as the pain would get too hard, they'd, they'd drop down and they would start to asphyxiate. I think that's the best probably example of what happens to somebody on the cross is you, you die of asphyxiation because you can't breathe when you're uh, hanging in that particular, that particular formation. And Barbe, I think, did a good job of showing that. As far as the, the, the death of asphyxiation, that's actually verified by the fact that the Roman common practice was to break the legs of the people on the cross. But uh, in the case of Jesus, they didn't break the legs, remember, because they found he was dead already. And they put the spear through him just to verify that, the lance. And in this particular case, though, is that, uh, that it's surprising that they were, they were not breaking legs. So it's a very close correspondence with what we expected in that case of the shroud. But uh, the nail wound is on the right wrist. Uh, that's not a big deal. Uh, three nails used for the crucifixion. That's, again, a minor detail, but uh, certainly interesting. Let's go into closer detail here on the particular shroud versus the Hungarian prey codex. We look on the left above the, what we see, this is the, the positive image of the shroud, which is all an artist would ever see. You wouldn't see the negative image like we see it today. So we see that the epsilon feature on above the left eyebrow is uh, very, very carefully, uh, almost exactly produced on the image. You don't see the epsilon feature really carefully, but uh, it's certainly very close. He does show a beard uh, in both cases. 
So it's a very, I think, a fairly good uh, correspondence. This particular case, that the this is another another uh, manuscript from uh, another from, image from the same manuscript, page plate four, in this particular case, and, and both images on the left are different um, images. One, the bottom one is from the shroud itself. It's called the inset, if you see on the left, to give you a close up on the on the hand that you see on the on the uh, particular one here. So the shroud on the on the left bottom and the manuscript itself on the top is a blow up on what's actually on the manuscript itself. And you can see that the, the, the uh, blood stain is surprisingly on the wrist at that point, which is not expected. Now close up on the, the lying down version of the Prey Manuscript, Prey, the Prey Codex, we have Joseph of Arimathea anointing the body with spices in this particular case. And as far as the uh, Joseph and Nicodemus, and perhaps Mary here at this point. But it, you can see very closely in this, in this image that the body is naked, the hands over the groin, exactly as the shroud. Very close correspondence against all the other uh, shroud, other images from art this particular time. So it's a close correspondence there as well. Now the bottom uh, picture, if you like, is from another page of the manuscript. It shows you the the herringbone pattern of the, uh, the, the, the cloth shows a, in this picture of time. You could argue what it actually shows, but it certainly seems to be a herringbone. But the most interesting feature is going to be the three little holes in the middle in the cloth in the bottom, which you can't see real well. So I'm going to blow it up here for another version. And blowing up version, you can uh, match the pictures on the codex almost precisely with the three uh, the four holes, L-shaped holes on the shroud, which is absolutely beyond the pale for mathematically uh, correspondence. Again, we have 11 different correspondences between the shroud and the, uh, uh, and the uh, prey codex. So it's a, a I, and, and certainly you can't, you, see, you can see the, the, the twill. The three in one till is the way it's formed, I'll show you later, is a, you have three, uh, three, uh, uh, threads one way and one thread the other way, and one going over well, three others in the other direction. I'll show you in a, when we get down the, the, the fabric part of the shroud, to benefit of those people that like fabrics. <laughs> so uh, we'll do that as well. Now moving on to uh, how the crucifixion was done, uh, from there we're going to talk about burial practices. Now the burial practices of the period of time were to put a dead person on a on a bench inside a, inside a tomb and then close a door in front of it. This is kind of an artist's rendition to show you how wrong you can be. This is not to show you how right you can be. Uh, in this particular case, it's the raising of Lazarus by Biomin Sega, uh, performed 11, 30, 11, 11, 13, 11, about when the, uh, the shroud is supposed to have been forged uh, in court by the critics in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, it's an unbiblical idea of the Jewish burial. According to this picture, it would look like you would have a burial by wrapping it like a mummy. Uh, in fact, that's what people, critics, in fact, there are Bible-believing critics. In fact, most of the um, divinity school scholars have, have held to this false idea that somehow that the uh, body is buried like a mummy because of the implication of what it says in John chapter uh, 19 and 20 is that if it's wrapped like a mummy, then it would be preserved for a long period of time. The Egyptians intended to last forever. But that's totally in variance with what Jewish burials are about. Jewish burials are supposed to decompose. They're not supposed, they're not, mummi they're not mummified, they're not uh, prepared in any way. The only reason they put spices in the room is so that it wouldn't smell. It's sort of like spraying with Lysol, you know, to, uh, to, to try to eliminate your odors, or just you want to put a good scent in. Well, the good scent, of the myrrh is not helping the body at all. All it is is masking the scent. In this particular case, they expected Lazarus to be smelly after four days. And the artist expected that he would be, that he would be like a mummy coming out of the tomb. Well, if anybody can imagine that, I find it hard to believe that the mummy can hop. Can anybody think the mummy can hop in that, in that configuration? I would, I would find that would pretty hard to believe. But in fact, that's what the artist was trying to follow the, contempt, the ideas of the day, how a, 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 a burial would be performed, knowing nothing about what 
burial practices were in the first century. And the burial practices were, like I said, bury him on a bench, maybe with a whole bunch of other bodies over a period of time, roll a stone in front, and, uh, and then a year later, they would open up the door and take out the one, the previous year's burial. And there'd be uh, several others in progress, perhaps, but they would take out the burial from years before, and they would put it in the ossuary, uh, the bone box of that family. In fact, you've heard a lot about bone boxes, I think, from in the news, but that would be the performance of Jewish burial practices during the first century. In the case of crucifixion, it might be different because they, one of the criticisms, in fact, I've seen it just today, uh, is that crucifixion victims were, were not accorded the right of uh, burial. They were left to rot on the cross. In fact, I just read the article of Bart Ehrman, an anti-Bible person, of saying that, oh, no, nobody buried the body during the first century. He isn't reading his literature, I guess, because he, then during the first century, Pontius Pilate and others were, were, were pacifying the Jews. They're doing things that they had to make Jews somewhat accommodating. They tried to accommodate the Jews, and so okay, I can give you other examples. But it certainly, they're not, they were crucifying people, but they weren't, uh, they, were, they, were, they were abiding by the Jewish burial practice. They were allowing them to bury their own dead. So Lazarus, going back to the scripture that's involved here in particular, Lazarus from John chapter 11. Then Jesus himself, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb, it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Jesus cried out with a low, loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the one who had died, he who had died, came for out bound hand and foot with linen strips, and his face was wrapped with a small cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. And the reason I put those Greek words in there uh, is to understand what it means by those contexts. Now, the word deo, bound, gives you an impression of wrapping. It's a, it's a, it's a binding of some type. But the, the false impression is, is to imply that word means to be bound like a mummy. It did not mean that. It meant he bound with linen strips, the caria, around their hands to hold them together and their feet to hold it together so the, the body basically would stay in one place. We have examples from the Dead Sea uh, area of burial sites where bodies were actually found buried in that manner. So, but the Sudarian, which we'll find later, is uh, a small cloth, not just a cloth. The, the Sindon or Unthia uh, is the larger cloth or cloth in general. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. So the point was, is that he walked forward. Well, mummies are not going to walk in that mummy form. What was the inference? Not a mummy. Lazarus' hands were felled by a cloth. Probably has grown, grown in pelvic area. His feet were held by, by known about burial practices. His feet were held by a cloth, and he hobbled. We know he hobbled. He came out of the tomb. So we know that he wasn't bound so tightly that he couldn't walk. Lazarus' face were bound shut. Now, how is he bound? If the, the, the cloth goes around the chin and up over the pate, so it's held together, so it holds the jaw, cloth, jaw closed. All those match the man on the shroud, which is very, very unusual. Now, going back, going to the minute, the linen on the shroud, the, the particular form of the fabric that's on the shroud, this is, I think, is also undocumented. The skeptics don't bring it out too much. They, uh, there are some, some, some critics that, that, that actually admitted that it's a problem, but not too many. But, the, but they were trying to point out the three-in-one herringbone cloth was, uh, was too complex, too strange. But like I just said, it was un unknown, almost unknown from the Middle Ages. So the only examples, the main examples they have is from Egypt over a thousand years before Christ. They do have examples of that. Uh, the Z-twist is actually uh, the type of linen that's formed, the way it's rotated clockwise or S-twist counterclockwise. So they actually have all these specifics that related to fabric but it's unlike the modern European fabrics. But the most, I think one of the most pointed things commonly missed about this whole thing is the fact the size of the quilt, the uh, size of the fabric, was almost precisely two by eight cubits of the Assyrian size in the first century. How would any, any forger know this? Well, I've seen one website, oh, well, they went and bought, bought a, a shroud from, an old shroud from uh, uh, of that size. Well, that's crazy, I mean, it's just like, how, why would they even bother? And in fact, when the Hall, uh, Teddy Hall tries to say that somebody just got an old cloth and flogged it, well, the point is, how are you going to get a three-in-one herringbone twill 
even if <laughs> there's not even being made during, during the uh, Middle Ages, uh, you, where are you going to find, and then make it precisely two by eight cubits? It just boggles the mind. It's just the cavalier nature of this, the fact that it's just, no, it's just like it's no big deal. Well, I think it is a big deal. And all these facts would be absolutely unknown to a 14th century forger. Well, let's point out another critic. And it's an article that was published in the scholarly literature. Um, she says that, or he says that uh, the, uh, there are so many plain weaves in the first century of these uh, fabrics that are made of wool and others. That have, we find these burial shrouds and almost, most of them are made of plain weaves of two and one. Uh, not, they're not made, they're just made without this three and one herringbone quilt. They're, twill. they're made in uh, just a simple weave. Well, the point is they're examining poor people. Josephus bought, was a rich man. He bought the best fabric that he could find. And we know that type of fabric was available. We know it's made in, in Egypt a thousand years before Christ. So it's not that it can't be found. It's just the fact that they, they haven't found that much of it. That, but I, you'll find something else that's new that really relates to that same subject. This particular one found, was found at Silwan village in, uh, in their uh, Kidron Valley and Ben Hum in the south of Jerusalem. So it's a new, a fairly new find, but the, the one making the article, this uh, Orit Shamir, has the tenacity to our temerity to actually say this disproves the shroud. Well, it doesn't. Just because you found a few examples of, of common burials doesn't mean that the shroud didn't have this more complex fabric available to it. So I think it's very presumptive. But the particular case that we find uh, is what we do find is that what's the nature of the bleaching characteristic? This is also new. I didn't find this out till just recently. The bleaching is uh, done separately for each batch. And you'll see the picture I actually have in the shroud of the bleaching characteristics. In the first century, up to the Middle Ages, during a whole period, and they call the Roman period, all the fabric was performed by bleaching each skein or each group of yarn by itself, just bleaching it. Uh, sun bleaching and other forms of bleaching, they have a type of, care, type of uh, soap wart they put on it that would preserve it. It was done differently. Well, what happens when you do that? When you do each group of, uh, of, 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 of cloth, of fabric, not fabric, but of uh, yarn separately, is the linen will actually have different color variations because different parts of it will be, will be bleached differently. This is absolutely not true during the Middle Ages. Absolutely not true. No one ever did this during the Middle Ages. They, all fabric shows that they bleach it after the cloth was made. This is absolutely mind-boggling in, in how this is being performed. But you'll see the color bleaching is very subtle, but you can actually see it in the picture that I have. The color shroud of Turin does show color patterns. It shows that the color patterns that, that the individual skeins of yarn were, of linen, were bleached separately. The inference, Shroud of Turin is not medieval. Now let's go on what the flax is like. And so you can just have some kind of a fun some slide slides to see what it's like here. Um, the, fun, the flax flowers are called, it's from a plant called Linum usitatissium. And this uh, is just a pretty flower, just to give you an idea what it's like. The linen was made of this type of plant. It was very durable. The fact it could last for thousands of years is actually very surprising. I mean, the fact we have linen from uh, over 1000 BC when we don't even have wood products. The fact is that these, these, uh, these fabric will be preserved when most of the wood is being decomposed, which is very surprising. So it's a very durable fabric. Now let's go to the shroud itself. This is discovered only in 2004 when the shroud was inverted. Most of you probably don't realize when the shroud was cleaned, 2002 to 2004 time period, they actually took the backing of called the Holland cloth that, that, that uh, the Middle Ages cloth that was, it was connected to, they turned it over to look at the backside of the shroud. To their surprise, they found it was an image on the backside of the shroud. Nothing in between. Remember I said it was only the topmost fibers. A very faint image of, of the parts of the man on the backside of the shroud, which is, I can't explain by any known mechanism, but it's certainly very surprising. But the most interesting they found out is the fact that this, the stitching that's found in the back of the shroud, there's actually a three and a half inch, so they call it a strip, connecting strip, that's on the side of the shroud that was added to the shroud, but it appears to be from the same, same cloth, from a different, a different section of the cloth, but it was definitely added and sewn in so precisely that no one notices it from the front side. And the, the artist, the uh, textile expert, uh, Metzger Fleury Lemberg, that examined it, 
was absolutely dumbfounded when she found this, the exact side of the shroud. Remember, you see the seam, that one inch seam, that the one centimeter seam that you can see in white there? That was, uh, you can't even see that on the front side of the shroud, which is, nobody even noticed it was there. The, neat, the stitching that's found in there, she said, it's not found on any fabric anywhere in the world except in Masada in the first century. And it's found many examples there. Now, I think that's absolutely mind boggling and very strong evidence that this shroud fabric was created in the first century. Of course, the critics can always say they just, they just went over to Jerusalem and bought an old fabric, you know, a Clinton fabric, and managed to monkey with that. Some people have, have, have uh, tried to form one of the famous critics, Joe Nichols, an atheist himself, very, very good skeptic, I think very careful one, has said, well, maybe they had a, uh, the artist got a man and crucified him in the 14th century and, and had a photograph made of him somehow with photographic techniques. You know, it's just the, my, the, the level of, of effort they tried to, to try to discredit the shroud is actually really amazing. But if you look, and even in this particular picture, uh, it's hard to see, but you can see more in the websites and other ones. The high and low density yarn bleaches, bleaching bandits on the shroud. There's actually every, every skein of yarn has got a slightly different bleach of yarn of uh, color of the shroud. But remember, the, you have to show high contrast pictures in order to see that kind of thing. These are taking the image in the black and white of the, and, and making more and more contrast. Anybody done Photoshop where you actually change the contrast, you can find when you, when you find fine images. Nobody would notice this until you actually have high technology photographic techniques. But it's not like creating it like we've seen with the, the images I showed you, talked to you about before. The images we found on the coins and the eyes and the, the plants are verified by trained experts, in particular case of the flower plants on the, the shroud, you'll actually form by a, uh, a, a Jewish um, a plant expert. And so you can't accuse them of being uh, favoring the shroud from religious reasons. And actually the most astonishing one is that the head of the whole sh uh, Shroud of Turin website is a Jewish scholar, Jewish Orthodox Jew himself. So it's amazing who's the shroud supporters of some of your strange people that you wouldn't imagine. Now, what is a herringbone weave? Getting back, I talked about that before. The herringbone weave is where you take a, a warp and a weft. Has anybody heard of warps and wefts before? It's for, most people don't know what that is. Warp is in the direction that your, your, your uh, uh, vertical direction that your, your loom is going in, and your weft is the cross direction. So in this particular case, you notice that the warp has going three different, uh, different lengths from one direction with the with a weft on the other side. That creates that pattern. And then every so often they reverse the direction. So you notice there's a zigzag pattern in the, uh, in the shroud and anything that's three in one herringbone cases. Um, has anybody had any recent fabrics like that? They're certainly very uncommon in today's world to have three in one herringbone weave uh, fabric, this particular case. Now here's another example without giving the, all the details on the pollen and the shroud and the, uh, the images. But I want to point out that the, both pollen and the, and the flower images found in the shroud again by, uh, you can say that they're just somebody's imagination, but he's a plant expert and he, he knows what he's doing and he found many examples of, of plants in the shroud. He's published books on it. So, and he's a Jewish uh, uh, botanist, so he's got some credibility for not being a shroud, shroudy person, but he found this Cardus argentatus, both in the pollen and the shroud. It was re-identified from another species that was identified before. Very pretty flower. But the most interesting thing about it is there are many examples of this particular type of uh, uh, pollen and, uh, and picture on the shroud that it only flowers in April and May. So uh, to my mind, it would be absolutely suitable for something being laid on the shroud as a uh, memento, like you would as a as a remnant, if you like. And, but as far as the, why there would be so many examples of pollen, well, if the flowers were laid on the shroud, it certainly would be expected to find the pollen there as well. And the fact that it would form in April, it flowers in that the period of time is actually a very good explanation why that, that image would be that if it was a genuine uh, artifact of that period of time. Here's, I think, another thing, I think a compelling argument for the, the shroud being uh, a first century uh, formed in Jerusalem Again, it, it's more the, the location than it is the date. This is the location. Uh, the strange thing about the sticky tape samples that they found is when they took it off the shroud, they, uh, 
found a, some dirt samples. And for some strange reason, they were able to identify that by examination with a travertine aragonite limestone uh, found in Jerusalem and found only there, uh, that complex uh, formation. That particular dirt that was formed on the heel is a uh, travertine aragonite is, has a signature it's very similar to limestone on the ancient Jerusalem tombs, and it has traces of strontium and iron, and quotes from Kolbeck, and an unusually close match. Well, when you make a close match, I've seen the, the uh, I didn't show you the, the graphs, but when you see that close match, it's, it's actually, uh, I would say, very improbable. I, I won't give a number on it that is formed in any other location in the world. It's just a very probable that that, 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 that dirt found on that, um, that heel mark is actually formed, I think, formed in the knee, knee as well, but it actually makes it very specific. That person that was on the shroud, that laid on the shroud, actually walked on a street that had limestone from Jerusalem. And that was actually published in an orthodox, in a uh, refereed journal, uh, Biblical Archaeology Review. He's a trained, uh, Kolbeck, a trained optical uh, analysis, and Nick Tosky is a trained uh, archaeologist that found it. So they're reputable scholars not somebody trying to just prove the shroud is genuine. Well, I want to finish with a quote here from Leo Tolstoy. He said, the most difficult subjects can be explained for the most slow-witted man if he has not formed any idea of them already. But the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he is firmly persuaded that he knows already without a shadow of doubt which is laid before him. And it's interesting, the anti-shroud people are not just simply from the left side, which might say one side, from the atheist side or the anti-Bible side, but also from the pro-Bible side. Almost all the Bible scholars that I know of, except for one exception, are very anti-shroud as authenticity shroud because they are so afraid of being associated with any relics that might be construed as a false uh, idol, something you're worshiping, some idolic figure. So you notice that I didn't show a lot of figures about the face of Jesus and how it proves this is the real Jesus because people tend to adulate it. I'm not one that wants to adulate. In fact, I'm actually opposed to that. I'm an anti-icon person. I don't want anybody to do that. In fact, one of the reasons that I actually am glad for the carbon-14 dating showing out of the 14th century is because people won't treat it as a genuine relic. I think it's an interesting object to, to be done, and uh, it, the jury may be out on what it exactly is, but it's certainly the, uh, not an end of the story as yet. So let's uh, finish with the review of what we do know and some of the things that we can find, and we can come up with your questions as well, that we covered some examples of what it's like optically, that is the optically, the, the, the shroud, from all different spectrums, UV, ultraviolet, infrared. It shows that the blood is on, on the shroud, real blood. They, they, they've claimed to have shown it's AD, AB positive blood. That's, that's maybe subjective. No one knows if that's valid, but it's, it's certainly you know, at least four, five or six tests for human blood are absolutely um, genuine. But you can't fake it by pouring blood on the shroud. That's the thing. You know it's human blood, but you, if you put blood on the shroud afterwards, the problem is it won't look the same. It won't have the same boundary. It'll, it, the boundaries that are shown in the shroud are sharp. From, um, from, uh, it's, it's totally unsimilar to what you would find if you just put the shroud on and afterwards. But we know what the blood was on there uh, before the image because when they've examined the, the, the shroud carefully, that the image of the the, uh, this discoloration only goes on just to the edge of the blood, but not under it. So we know the image was formed after the blood was formed. No artist would ever do that. That's again discrediting that particular formation. We find the pollen that's formed in it. There's 58 uh, varieties of pollen. Only 17 of those pollens were from France when it was supposedly, there, France and Italy, where it was supposedly there all its history. But uh, the majority of the pollen was formed in Jerusalem. Over half of it formed in that type of pollen I showed you before. Than that type of plant. And uh, so it's uh, definitely a pollen. It's definitely a big problem for saying it's formed. People say it's formed and uh, flogged from the, the fabric in the Middle Ages. So the fabric was uh, very similar to first century fabric formations, the sewing mechanisms, the, the type of cloth formation, the fact it's bleaching patterns. All of it point toward a, a Roman period of, uh, fallen, of a fabric creation. The dirt from the travertine argonite Limestone is very indicative of a, uh, that shroud was formed by a man who was laid, that was in, walked in Jerusalem. We find that the shroud is actually 
beyond um, any capability for a forger to know exactly like a Roman crucifixion would actually be performed. It was formed a 120 dumbbell-like marks all over the body from left and right, from as if there were two lictors on either side, exactly the way the Romans have recorded how they performed a, a, um, a flogging, if you like that, with the flagrum. Uh, different methods were formed. They actually find more precise examinations of found examples with discolorations elsewhere in the legs of different types of torture instruments, which are also known, have been used, but I won't go into that today. Uh, as far as Jewish burial practices, the Shroud shows exactly the way it would have been formed and, and uh, historically, as well as the, the prey manuscript, how the hands be folded over the groin, naked body, uh, is intended to be, uh, to be decomposed in a year and been put in a bone box. So it was definitely not that. Oh, as far as washing the body is concerned, that's somewhat debated, but you realize that in John chapter 19, it says that the, that the Sabbath was nigh at hand. It means that, that the Joseph of Arimathea, when he's trying to, and he gets permission to get the body down from the cross after 3 p.m., it takes a long time for, for um, Pontius Pilate to get agreement that he's dead, and then Josephus will go and help get, and get the body from the Romans. He didn't actually take the, shroud, the body down himself, probably, but he, he, uh, he, he did it with the Romans, uh, centurions, and he, at that period of time, they would, he would be at the body prepared for burial, but according to what the, da, the night, John chapter 19, the Sabbath was at hand, meaning that, that the sunset is almost there. They had to race to the tomb. They didn't have time probably to do a burial. They know they didn't do a burial practice because we know the women were coming back on Sunday. They, and they know the women get to get spices to come back when they're in, on the, next, the third day. So we know that their body wasn't prepared by a, a normal burial. It could have been not even raw, washed. But we suspect it may have been partially clean. We know also from material burial practices that all the blood from any uh, crucified victim or any victim of violence, all the blood is preserved. Very interesting fact. They don't throw away that bloody cloth. They save it. It goes buried with the body. They expect in the resurrection, the body, the blood will be preserved as well, I presume. But that's an interesting fact. So the burial practices match very precisely. The Shroud history from 1355 to present, uh, it was, it was uh, almost uh, burned in a, a 14... Uh, 92 fire, it was, they had, had, uh, had silver marks that burned big holes, holes in the shroud. Uh, we, could, we could have been at the point, and some people have argued, that was when the carbon-14 got changed with the, uh, the soot that was present there. There's still a possibility of changing the carbon date, I don't know. But uh, certainly it was also almost, almost burned in 1970, uh, 1997. There was a, a arsonist that almost burned the building flames coming in the building, and a uh, fireman came in and, and broke the, uh, the, the, the box. They couldn't find the keys to open it with, so it was flaming, and it was flames everywhere. The fireman came and broke the mallet with a fire bulletproof glass, glass with, a, with a mallet. It was very, much been a very exciting scene. An instant glass that's, that even a bullet can penetrate, he had to smash with a mallet. I would think that would make a good movie, wouldn't it? But uh, kind of like a last minute pulling out the shroud and, uh, and rescuing it in, in the midst of the flames. I think that would be a good film. Uh, but uh, that's so the theory is very, very sketchy as far as the people have tried to destroy the shroud and been unsuccessful. Uh, during the uh, Nazi re regime during World War II, they secreted it to a, uh, another location. But if everybody knows, the Nazis were destroying all works of art, of, especially they would have destroyed the shroud. Uh, as far as the Mendelian this of cloth, I don't have time to talk about it all today, but uh, certainly there's a history of a, another cloth that we've seen in the, in the in, we showed in the, at least the Prey Manuscript, the Prey Codex, there was another cloth that, that could have been the shroud and from, uh, from uh, 50, no, 5, 550 to 944, and then from 944 to, in Edessa, and then from 944 to 1204 in Constantinople. So there's a documented cases of a cloth that was in that, in that lo lo locations. So in, from 1204, when it was taken by the uh, Crusaders, uh, no one knows exactly, but it probably was, if it was still the same shroud, it was in possession of the uh, Knights Templar. We know that uh, uh, Geoffrey de Charnay was probably related to a Charnay that was a Templar. Very clear, he could have been in possession of that. There is a, a hypothesis that will form that, but no, that's a very subjective, their characteristic of a uh, period of time. Art history, the Hungarian uh, uh, Prodex. So we didn't talk, the carbon, reviewing the carbon 14 uh, uh, 14 uh, uh, fraud. 
the Bible skeptics are basically saying the carbon-14 dating proves the shroud had to be a, a, a uh, recent creation. No, 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 and I'm arguing not, nothing of the case. It's not even close. Beside the statistical variance test, varying that, there's also many other mechanisms and has shown from other carbon-14 dating that this could have been easily a, um, a skewing of the carbon-14 amounts in it by other methods. Certainly, the statistical variance test was, was invalid, invalidates. The fact they didn't sample all the way through the cloth, they only sampled one suspect region that could have been uh, repaired. Uh, we talked about the Hungarian prey codex, how closely it matches it a century before it's supposed to be formed, and yet with 11 different characteristics, they've shown an exact, exact match with the shroud and the uh, prey codex. So as far as the only thing I haven't talked about, and I probably won't talk about, is how was it formed? People's any, any guess. If it is a genuine uh, relic of Jesus Christ being resurrected, some people argued for a resurrection flash. Uh, I cannot judge on that. All I can say is that's the only mechanism that works is some type of uh, radiation mechanism. And it also has, because it has to work at a distance. Remember, it's not a contact one. At least it shows from the 3D characteristics that it has to be, but something within four or five inches is formed on the shroud from image but nothing any further, meaning that contact did not form the image. It was a va could have been a vapor. Skeptics have pointed to some type of vapor that could have formed the image, but the image is too precise, too carefully characteristics. Skeptics have also said, well, what about, I, one of the skeptics I read about just recently said that, well, wait a minute, there's hair that's vertical on, on the shroud, but it would have fallen down if it was a, um, it was a uh, real, real picture of the, of the man on the shroud. Well, wait a minute, no, no, they've shown that the, that the burial practices is to have a cloth around it, and it do show them examples on the particular one that there was cloth, there was something holding the hair back, and the, the hair would in fact form over the cloth. I didn't mention the fact that there's also examples of little point marks all over the, the skull from the resurrection of the, uh, from the uh, possible, the skull, skull cap of uh, thorns. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a crown of thorns, it was a whole cap of thorns. I haven't agreed uh, that, but it does agree with the Bible in every case that I can find. Recent forensics, art, Roman crucifixion, first century fabric, Middle East pollen and dirt. And uh, I think that it's a very good example of something that I, we don't have to have faith in it, but we can have to show that there is an example of, from, our, from our history that will validate that uh, Jesus, in fact, did rise from the dead. And I think that's uh, worth considering. What I do want to say is that don't put your faith in the shroud, put your faith in Jesus Christ as your only Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, thank you, gentlemen. All right, we got a uh, time to take up an offering and uh, gonna do a call for questions as soon as we've uh, concluded that. That was awesome, John, Dr. Johnson, <laughs> I appreciate that. So much, so much to cover there, you know? Has to condense like a 10-hour seminar down into a one-hour talk, and so much you can go into there. Let me uh, just offer up a prayer for our offering this evening. Father, we uh, thank you for Dr. Johnson again. We just ask for your blessings upon him, Father, and uh, the, the tremendous uh, testimony that he brings, Father. And we just ask your blessings for Cedar Park Church and for all the educational opportunities that are afforded here. For the Christian school, Father, that you would bring many young people to uh, learn about learn about uh, your saving grace in Jesus Christ through, uh, through, this, through Cedar Park School and through the many other ministries of this, uh, of this cathedral. Church, Father, we just ask your blessings upon Cedar Park. We ask your blessings upon the offering that uh, it will be used to the furthering of your ministry, to the bring, bringing people to the knowledge of uh, how to defend the Bible and uh, to be better witnesses for you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, we don't have long, but we definitely have time to take a couple of questions. So uh, if you want to raise your hand, I can bring the microphone around. We can uh, got a time for a couple of questions. He beat you guys. Just one second. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about how it's, it's unclear exactly how that image of a person could be projected onto that cloth and how radiation is like one of the only ways we could potentially look at it at this point. Um, but if indeed an artist was to try to recreate something like that, um, are there any offerings into how an artist could actually do that? Like what, what medium would they use to create that type of image? Well, they have tried. Uh, Doe Nichols is a good example in his book. I actually commend him. He does a good job of, of, of skepticism. I'm, in fact, in fact, I'm a member of the Skeptics Association uh, because I'm skeptical of a lot of things that they, including things they aren't skeptical of. But, uh, but the point is, is that, is that image-forming mechanisms, all that's being produced, 
by vapors and ammonia, different, different uh, characteristics, touch, uh, dust, different types of dust, don't have the accuracy. The, the fact that for now, the reason that I have a hard time even having any mechanism for it, the precision of the image that's so on the shroud is not the ones they, by these other methods. Like you say, vapors and things like that, they would all be diffuse. In fact, the, I think one of the best arguments against the shroud by the skeptics is the fact the image is too precise. It's like a photograph. It's like, how do you get the image to go vertically rather than you know, out from the perpendicular from the body? If it's, in fact, the body was emitting some type of radiation, how do you get it to go vertically? I mean, go right on the shroud. So it's all the images that are formed. Yes, you read the literature. There's lots of images that are formed, but they're all very, very, very poor. And they don't have this 3D property as well. Uh, the fact is just but disproportionately the distance from the shroud that get you know, weaker and weaker, and also that they, they, they are very directional as well. You know, the fact that it's just all in different directions. Because remember, a camera is all toward your lens. You have, have anybody had taken a camera that's not focused? That was what you'd get, it's not, an unfocused camera image. So, does that help? Um, I was wondering, um, on the same subject here, uh, I mean, Jesus was in the tomb for three days approximately, right? So, have anybody tried to duplicate that? I mean, three days seems like a short time for an image to appear on anything, you know? And, um, and also, the other question I have is related is that uh, even if it was proved this uh, shroud was from that time period, uh, there's no way to prove that's Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, and also, because there were, weren't there other people crucified as well, well yeah. in that time period, and they probably, um, it could be somebody else. I mean, well, that the, time there's, a good, there's a good answer to that, which is actually uh, Steve Shaversman and other, many other skeptics have pointed out. It says, um, there's too many examples of precision that of this, the crown of thorns, all the different characters, Lance, the bone's not broken. The skeptics all admit, says, if it is genuine, it's that of Jesus Christ, or at least supposed to be, you know, by some mechanism. So there's actually agreement on both skeptics and believer sides that, in fact, it, there wasn't, it wasn't another person. If, it, if somebody did it, they mocked up a Christian victim to look like Jesus, perhaps, but that'd be the closest they could come. On. As far as, it's just too many examples. It wasn't just a random person that, that had been formed. As far as forming the image, let me finish the other part of the question, was the fact that the image formation mechanism over three days is not the methods that are being proposed. It's in fact something that happened at the resurrection to cause this image to be formed. The, the actual critics point the other direction. They just said, well, wait a minute. I'm talking about Bible critics, Bible-believing critics as well. It says if there was no record in the Bible of anything, any cloth having any image on it. So that's a good question, good, you know, good argument against it. If there's no, no, mark, tell the, the, the fifth, third century, there's no even mention that somebody might have a shroud. It shows up in a desert all by itself without anybody having mentioned it, it was a cloth. But I think that if the image was formed by this discoloration mechanism that we talked about, there was no image on it at first. The image gradually, it, it was a discoloration. It's called an accelerated aging. So this, the phenomena that hit the cloth caused it to age prematurely, and the image did, only the blood was there, so the image would not have been seen for maybe, you know, 100 years. Okay, well, for me, based on all the other positive evidence you have, the word you said a minute ago was photo, photographic. I mean, as an amateur photographer for years, it could have been a, a celestial light, a very bright light, and over time, as you would develop paper in a tray or film in a tray, it could have, the image could have appeared over time, but I, I think it was a bright light because it's a negative image. Well, you read the books, and especially by the skeptics, they do make a good argument that uh, they've held up a body on a, on a pole and, and they've had a pinhole camera and it says, we can try to create a image using a bright light and trying to, over a period of days, and trying to form uh, an image on the other side. So it is a, quote, feasible method of creating an image, but uh, of course, the body is going to decompose and it's not going to stay in one place either, so it's not a very good way of forming that accurate. But you're right about one thing. A pinhole camera does make an accurate uh, lens. It does, it, that does work. It's just hard to get enough light for a long period of time, and you'd have to have a genius to create photographic photography, you know, five centuries too early. And so actually the funny one, the funniest part about that is that 
people have proposed, well, somebody really smart like Leonardo da Vinci, you know, commit, you know found this photography technique early. Well, he was, he was born a century later, so <laughs> it doesn't work real well. Yeah, God can make a bright light, yes. <laughs> Good point, yes? Uh, some people take the position that they think they can see a ponytail on the back image. Do you have um, a I've heard that. It's, uh, uh, the ponytail was, a, in fact, a Jewish uh, uh, mode of uh, expression of hair. Again, it's, uh, you, you're de when I say that, even though the, accurate, the, the photography, if you call it, on the trout is very accurate, very precise, um, things like ponytails and things like that are very subjective because you're dealing only just with minor changes in fabric density. So even when I, that's why I didn't bring up today on the, the coins on the eyes, even though I think it's a good argument, it's still, you know, is it in your mind or is it really there? I mean, type thing. So you're right, ponytails are, are claimed to have been found in the shroud. Next. Yeah. Bill. Hey, John, I just happened to pick up the uh, John, uh, the, the Bible there about okay. that uh, John chapter 20. And this is when uh, Peter went in, um, he arrived, he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. So I just thought, it does say something a little bit about it, that it was... Well, I didn't get around to that, uh, putting that scriptures in, because it got too ponderous, all this material here. But you're right, is that Bible-believing skeptics like Josh McDowell and I said almost all the mainline community think that John chapter 19 and 20 is incompatible with the Shroud. I, I disagree with them, but again, I've talked to you a little bit when I talked to you about Lazarus, but in fact, the body was not wound like Josh McDowell and others think. It was found by a strip, linen strip over the top, not over by, not wound, if that helps. It was, but again, oh, there's also saying, the argument says, well, what about these 100 pounds of spices? Well, well 100 pounds of spices were only there to uh, preserve it for three days. I mean, it wasn't there. The body wasn't supposed to be preserved. It was supposed to be kept from smelling because the women are going to come in three days later. They didn't want to enter a stinky tomb, right? Anyway, next. Um, can you help me understand? You said that when they drove the nails through the hands that the thumbs were gone, and the second question I have, has any artist tried to paint a picture of Jesus from the imprint of the shroud? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, no one discovered that fact until 1930 when Barbe actually experimented with cadavers, and they found out when you put the, the, uh, a nail through the, the thing, the thumb closes up. And so that was surprising, but the crucified victims will probably lose their thumbs and from front, and uh, when that happens. So that's what that said. And the other thing was about artwork, is that, in fact, going back to the fifth century, artwork started to look like the face of Jesus. But again, I, as I kind of implied, there was, there was no full shroud of Jesus that anybody saw. They only saw the, sh according to the stories anyway, they only saw the head part from the fifth century up to the, about the 12th century. But when the time the Prey Codex is the first time we have far examples of actually the whole shroud, where people are allowed to see it. It only comes out once in a long time, both times. And that's why it, it doesn't going to have this argument that it somehow got pollen from the Mideast is ridiculous. I mean, it only came out once, once in a while. So uh, certainly didn't bring it out during a hurricane type thing. But as far as the whole art, almost all the art from the history of art is always on the face. And there's, and uh, um, Wenger and uh, uh, Ivan Wilson, various have done studies of all these many, many places of the artwork corresponds with the face of the shroud, the epsilon features, the, the, the marks on the forehead, the uh, blood marks, the, all these things correlate the artwork to the shroud picture. How they ever would see it, I have no idea because I can't see it without that black and white image. You'd have to look at it pretty close. Is that it? Oh, one back there. Yeah, I was going to comment on your uh, Wolf and Wharf. Okay. On uh, when I worked many years ago at Nordstrom's, the thousand-dollar ties. They had three dimension <laughs> weaved in them. When right. you looked at them, that's and you had to know all that stuff to sell a thousand-dollar tie. So it kind of, you know, it goes along with your expensive linen cloth that he had. But uh, we had to learn that that stuff. And then uh, I was going to throw out a kind of a theory when he was talking about the three dimension of the the body on the cloth. Uh, Dr. Duncan McDougall, he did the 21 grams back in 1888, where they said whoever would die, first him or his wife, they would take a picture of the, each other, and then they caught their soul leaving the body. 
and they weighed her and saw that she won 21 grams. And they did this test. It was a non-spiritual test across many bodies, and they all found they lost 21 grams, but the animals lost nothing that they photographed. It. <laughs> so it's just a theory, but would that transfer through huh. you know, the cloth? When, you know, I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can answer that back, one. You know. I've heard about that, but it, I, it's, it's got to be it's uh, out there. I hear you, but it's just very a subjective. Yeah. OK. All right, we can take one more question, then we're going to go ahead and close down. She's had her head out for a while. Okay, so I have an observation. When they did a forensic reconstruction of what Jesus probably looked like, it was in Popular Mechanics and other things a couple years ago, they pictured him as a uh, close cropped hair, making the argument that Jewish men of that area in the first century would have had short hair, and then the long hair was more a medieval um, rendering of what Jesus looked like. Um, on top of that, I also wonder, just, you know, thinking of the Passion of the Christ, for example, he was much more severely beaten in that movie, for example. I know it's a movie, but then the shroud reflects, so I'm just kind of curious of well, your thoughts. Well, I didn't see the, that particular movie. In fact, I won't see it, but, but the point is, is it's not historically accurate either the Bible. He wasn't, didn't follow the Bible or, he, or, or, or the shroud or anything like that. He formed a, a clairvoyant, somebody that, that has mystic visions. So you're right, he did make some artistic license to make it more savage beating uh, period of time. As far as the short hair is concerned, um, that's simply somebody's subjective analysis. Uh, as far as I, I find in the records that long hair is, is certainly preferred in the first century, but again, I, that's, a, that's an open question. But certainly, it's certainly from, from the shroud at least, we validate that it's long hair. So. And, and the shroud, I, I know you didn't show some really good pictures of the back, yeah. I think, trying to just be a little uh, um, gentle on us. But the, the shroud image does show that the, 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 whoever that person was, was severely beaten. The back and the legs all just completely covered right. in flagrant marks. I that mean, was just the, the opposite one. The entire ones. thing. If you get to pull up some good, good images off the web, you can see just well, how massive. And the, in, the, in the handout, I have all the links to that. I, but I also fairly put the skeptic links in. I said, I am really uh, have an admiration for Joe Nichols for saying that, in fact, he's skeptical that it could be formed by an artist. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it could form by a, somebody taking a real body in. He thinks he can form it, but he said doesn't think an artist could do it. You guys thank Dr. Johnson for us, if you want, please. <laughs> Let me remind everyone that next week I'm going to be doing a talk on worldviews, worldviews and conflict, looking at that issue. Then pa Pastor Feeden is here again, third and fourth Wednesdays every month, talking about Bible places and people. Next month, first Wednesday next month, we have Patrick Nury going to be doing a talk on the geology of Israel. And Ron Penny in the back wanted me to mention that this, is it this Saturday, Ron? Can you hear me back there? Is it this Saturday? That there's a, a, a field trip out of Mount St. Helens, if you're, so if you're interested in taking a field trip out of Mount St. Helens this Saturday, looks like the weather's going to be pretty good. Talk to Ron back there at the book table and he can uh, get you some information on that. Dr. Johnson, would you close us in a word of prayer? Yes, okay. Dear Lord, we thank you for this chance to share, Lord, and share my faith that I believe the Bible is reliable, but I also believe that science has got something to instruct us and help us in that uh, ever. And that's what the purpose of our Bible science investigations for Chris and myself and others. We thank you, understanding your will and your word. We just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.